how's it going, everyone? Thank you for joining me on another episode of the Music Reviewer Podcast. My name's Josh, and uh, welcome to another episode of uh, our album review series. I believe today is going to mark album t- uh, 25 or episode 25. Um, wow, that's... I'm not going to say it's a milestone, but uh, we kind of I kind of got to this point faster than I expected, uh, even though I kind of knew I would I would be covering a lot of uh, music. Uh, yeah, 25 uh, episodes of uh, the podcast minus uh, or without taking into consideration uh, best and worst track of the week and also uh, worth a listen. <clears throat> but today I think I have a pretty um, exciting episode, or at least from my perspective. Uh, this is going to be the sixth uh, album by The Killers. Uh, the name of the album is titled Imploding Mirage. Um, it was recently released um, not too long ago in on August 20, uh, 21st. So, uh, yeah, it's been about uh, slightly over a week since uh, that album came out. And, uh, yeah, before we get started, I just want to let everyone know that uh, a new episode of Best and Worst Track of the Week for the week of June. Uh, August 29th is up. If you haven't listened to it, go ahead and take a listen if you're interested in uh, that week's activity. Um, To me, it was sort of a tame week, but nonetheless, I thought it was uh, the best track was worth uh, listening to the episode to find that out. Also, the last review was over uh, Luke Bryan's Born Here, Live Here, Die Here, which was the first official country album, and I thought it was, uh, quite fitting that it was Luke Bryan, with him being such the, such a prominent, prominent presence in country music, but nonetheless, just get started. So, like I said in the introduction, um, this is going to be the latest album from The Killers, um, titled Imploding Mirage. It's the sixth studio album by the um, American alternative rock band. Uh, at this point, the Killers don't really need much of an introduction um, unless you aren't too familiar with uh, the biggest names in uh, rock over the, or not even rock, but more maybe just indie uh, pop and stuff like that over the past uh, 20 years now almost. But anyways, here is a brief uh, synopsis of who the Killers are. They are an American rock band formed in Las Vegas, uh, Nevada, uh, all the way back in 2001. Um, The full lineup was actually completed in 2002. The two original members uh, were Brandon Flowers, the front man, and also the the guitarist for most of the band's uh, lifetime, uh, David Kooning. And in 2002, they eventually capped off the uh, rest of the lineup with adding a bassist and a drummer, the drummer being Ronnie Venucci Jr. and Mark Sturmer on bass. Um, Since then, uh, the lineup hasn't really fluctuated other than recently on the last album cycle. It was announced that Mark Stormer, uh, I think that's how you say his last name, and Ronnie Venucci Jr. Actually, no, uh, Mark Stormer, the bassist, and David Kooning, the guitarist, um, would be departing the band as uh, still official members, but not really uh, taking part in touring. And also, uh, it's ambiguous whether they really play a part at all in the recording. And I feel like uh, later on, I'll touch more on how maybe this could have affected the album. Uh, But nonetheless, in 2002, the lineup was completed. Uh, To this day, they are considered one of the biggest rock bands of the 21st century. Uh, They sold more, they have sold more than over 20, 8 million albums. Uh, They are an international headliner by all standards. Um, I mean, the first album I covered on this podcast was the latest Strokes album, and I think I mentioned on there that the Strokes uh, are headliners in just about most regions of the world. I'd say that's just about the same for the Killers. The Killers, I think, being a little bit more uh, mainstream friendly, uh, with the uh, massive hit Mr. Brightside and just uh, the music in general, I'd say is slightly more accessible. Um, but yeah, the uh, the band kind of got their start too. I think it's interesting to point out that the first two demos they recorded, one of the tracks was Mr. Brightside. So um, it, 
I don't know really uh, what how the songwriting came about. If they're working with uh, some songwriters or a particular producer to make a potential worldwide hit, but I feel like it's quite lucky when the first thing you put out as a band, uh, just messing around, is going to be uh, a massive hit, such as Mr. Brideside, that is till this day is still culturally relevant and still gets tons of airplay on radio state thousands of radio stations across the world. Anyways, I believe the upbringing of the killers and how they formed is quite interesting um uh, especially them performing in las vegas i think the only other band i really know that made it from there uh, around that time was panic at the disco and panic at the disco is a widely uh, vastly different band in many respects um and brandon if you look into brandon flowers biography i believe he's from originally from utah uh being uh, raised a mormon which i don't know if there's anything much more representative of a oxymoron than being a mormon front man of a rock band now the killers aren't necessarily known for having you know themes of sex drugs and alcohol in their music uh there are moments when you do have those topics but it's not to the level of raunchiness or uh outlandishness that you'd expect from many rock bands and brandon Fowler flowers is kind of also very classy in his approach and he doesn't act you know like a typical douchebag and uh like many rock front men would put off and you know from what i'm from what I'm aware, he's been married most of his career. Um, I just find it interesting that those worlds co collided and they uh, they meshed to have lots of success. Um, I, I don't know if there's any other prominent Mormon musicians. Uh, if there has been, I obviously don't know about it. But I guess just to move forward with the synopsis of the killers, the, their progression in Las Vegas was pretty unique from what I read. Uh, researching it is that they were kind of the one of the first bands that kind of were taking from indie pop and rock influences from the UK. And they were aware of what the Strokes were doing around that time too, but it, they kind of stu stood out in the Las Vegas music scene, which was still being kind of... Uh, saturated with like acts like new metal and stuff like that uh, they were seen as kind of like an outlier but they're also respected from what it seems um, and also the drummer uh, Venucci Jr. was studying music at University of Las Vegas it is um, kind of a, a urban legend there that the killers would rehearse there I don't know if that's true but that's what it says on Wikipedia I don't know. I just found it interesting that a uh, a one-time uh, unknown band was rehearsing in a universe, a public university's uh, band hall rehearsal space, uh, struggling to find a place to rehearse. And later they are at the top of the game and uh, are worldwide well-known acts, somewhat of a household name even. Um, but yeah, that's um, you know the rest. Basically, they found success in their. Uh, debut album uh hot fuss which was released in 2003 uh till this day it remains an important album in indie and alternative rock from the 2000s with tracks like somebody told me smile like you mean it um all the things i've done and um to me i guess the killers around that time i they were integral in my sort of introduction to uh I guess alternative rock. Uh, somebody told me I remember being quite young when that came out, and I was quite intrigued by the sound and uh, you know the whole uh, perception of the killers. Um, little did I know that I guess I'd become more of a uh, avid listener of them. Uh, I kind of just only stuck with somebody told me for a while, but uh, nonetheless, Sam's Town, uh, their second album, had mixed critical reception, I believe, but it also featured classics like When You Were Young and Read My Mind, and I, I remember when those songs were coming out, too. I uh, never disliked them. I always thought they were quite good, and to this day, I still think When You Were Young was, is one of the best killers tracks of all time. And it's safe to say that each album has been somewhat of a success after releasing uh, Day and Age, uh, then Battleborn, then Wonderful Wonderful, the album, uh, most recent album prior to this one, uh, Imploding Mirage. And um, in general, um, 
yeah, the killers have just been uh, quite consistent. Uh, you know, Day and Age had some uh, tracks that are still to this day quite relevant. I'd say Battleborn was probably the weakest out of all of them. I think that released in 2012. That one just didn't really have much... Uh, much presence i think around that time uh, i think they were struggling to uh now looking back maybe stay uh i guess present in the current sound of music uh, i don't really know if they're just uh old-timey at that time and people were just moving on to things like i don't know uh, i guess around 2012 imagine dragons and like alt j and uh, some other bands uh, in the indie scene were uh, kind of taking over things. Um, but anyways, uh, I also would like to point out that Sawdust, their B-Sides, is probably one of the best B-Sides albums I've ever heard. Um, there's collaborations with Lou Reed on there that I think are awesome. And then just some songs that I think are, were strong enough to have made a Killers album uh, had they had the chance. Um, I'm thinking of, let's see, I have Sawdust pulled up here. Uh, Shadow Play, the uh, Joy Division cover. That's an excellent cover. All the pretty spaces. Leave the bourbon on the shelf. Sweet Talk, Under the Gun. Uh, this could have been maybe an album in itself, but I think they're just early. Most of these tracks were early demos that the Killers never quite put on their albums. Um, but nonetheless, um, I guess I'll touch on Wonderful, Wonderful. Um, and I think this album... Um, was kind of going since maybe Battleborn wasn't such a strong album and probably their uh their most lackluster and commercially successful. I'm just speculating. I don't I don't know if it was. Um I'm thinking that just starting from the opening track Wonderful Wonderful. Um they were maybe going for a indie pop kind of Portugal the man type of sound at times and I think that's evident in their opening track wonderful wonderful um but I, I did enjoy a lot of things off this album like the man which still this to this day I think is a great track from the killers probably one of my favorite tracks from the killers overall um and I think the overall the album also had like a more straightforward typical killer songs type of uh, approach with Brandon Flowers crooning a lot and then also featuring some elements of rock that the killers have always used throughout their career uh, nothing was too surprising on the album and also the album had like some slow burners that I thought were a little lacking in energy um, but I'd say that this is where the interesting topics of how the band uh, has kind of uh, had members fall off, uh, comes up, especially when you see their guitarist is no longer wanting to really contribute artistically in recording, and also touring uh, has been out of the question, and then also the basis has some uh, similar issues, although it is noted that he has a hearing injury and he, it affects his way, his uh, performance, I think, which is understandable. If you can't hear, it it's, would be uh, almost impossible to play an instrument. Um, but I'd say I, if you go back to Wonderful Wonderful, if you see the more pop, uh, indie pop tropes in there, uh, it you kind of can speculate that maybe there is some uh, artistic division where maybe Brandon Flowers and uh, Venucci Jr. were more t going towards keeping the killer's name relevant and putting music that people were going to want to listen to in 2017 when the album came out. I Like I said, there's still like typical rock elements of a killer's album, but also it's, uh, for some of the album and uh, not all of it, it's missing and it just feels like a little bit more uh, accessible and contemporary rather than what you would have heard on Hot Fuss or uh, Sam's Town um, or, or even I maybe not day and age, but the first two albums specifically. Um, and then what, when we get here and what we get here on imploding Mirage, I think is a more, more of a diversion of the classic killer sounds and more of a similar situation to what happened to Planet panic at the disco when most of the members fell out and you kind of just have backing tracks for the front man being this being Brandon flowers and 
Panic at the Disco, that being Brendan Urie. Now, no way, shape, or form are killers hitting in the direction of Panic at the Disco. It basically has just become a, a mainstream pop act. Uh, what I think the killers here could possibly doing be doing is just promoting the songwriting talent and just overall prominent and prominence in Brandon Flowers' voice. Uh, now, he did have a brief solo stunt as well, which I feel the music at some points with it being so 80s influenced uh like on imploding mirage um i feel like this is similar to that solo album specifically like the singles that i remember coming off of there um and uh, this is all speculation there could be there's probably a lot more to this but it just makes sense that if uh, the guitarist uh, of the Killers, Dave Kooning, who is still officially in the band, is no longer contributing to even uh, artistic uh, progression and and trying to contribute to writing practice, um, that the sound is moving away from like his iconic guitar playing like in when you were young or all the things that i've done or like a lot of the riffs that were essential to hot fuss in general and sam's town um now I, the, a lot of that sound has kind of been dissipating i'd say but um it if it's just kind of being thrown out uh, i can see why maybe even touring is also thrown out of the window for him uh, due to not having the option of playing more material that would feature him um and uh it kind of it kind of just makes sense if you look at it from that way now the basis thing um the it could be that it's there's other reasons i think the the bassist was also going to school so it just maybe just lack of interest but um it's kind of up in the air where these two members are at with the band uh now the, the killers brandon flowers and venucci jr have taken the approach of, of being quite civil and saying if you ever want to come back the door's right open yeah uh, you know which i think is a good thing to do i would hate to see the killers break up in any way or form officially uh but nonetheless um it seems as imploding mirage uh, takes a bit of a tangent, uh, even from the things like on Wonderful Wonderful. Um, they kind of went with a sort of formula, um, and I think that comes mainly from the production, uh, that being uh, covered by Mr. John Everett and Jonathan Radu of Foxygen fame. Now, I'd say the uh, former John Everett is probably the most influential, and I'd say that because just looking on this dude's uh, latest uh, discography or I guess credits for mixing and engineering um, yes he was on the killers uh, wonderful wonderful for mixing but he has worked with just about like everything he's touched has just just about been a prominent act in the I guess indie pop indie rock scene um, going you know all, all as recently as like Haim's album this year, Chicano Batman, uh, King Princess Beck, um, Brittany Howard of Alabama Shakes Claro, Vampire Weekend's last album, uh, yeah, Father of the Bride, Local Natives, Hosier, Foxygen, Jenny Lewis, uh, Kurt Vile, Houndmouth, Casey Musgraves, The Voids. <laughs> Uh, uh, the War on Drugs, which I think this album takes a lot from their last album, A Deeper Understanding. But even that, before that, in 2017, he touched that Grizzly Bear album, Painted Ruins, Social, uh, Broken Social Scenes album, Perfume Genius, War Paint, The Growlers. <laughs> it is ridiculous how much this guy touches any prominent uh, indie act. Like, this is his bread and butter. And... Yeah, the uh, other uh, uh, producer, uh, Jonathan Radu, I feel like uh, that was a good choice for the Killers in theory, too, because Foxygen is kind of like this indie gem for a lot of people. I did enjoy a lot of their stuff from their last EP. It is quite earwormy and catchy, and it's kind of a fresh sound. Um, and they've always, the Foxygen has always kind of like been a, uh, a, a blogosphere indie darling too um, with most of the things they've touched even though uh, objectively the one of their albums was a flop 
Um, but uh, <clears throat> I, I think this uh, this pairing uh, kind of made for an album that was a little derivative of a lot of certain tropes. Um, and I guess you can start from my soul's my own soul's warning, which is the opening track here. Immediately on this track, uh, you kind of get the same, you kind of get the same gist and overall sonically, like the same uh, sound palette that you'd get like on a War on Drugs sound track. It is like very similar. Uh, I'd say there's, uh, going from the very beginning of the song, uh, that's just obvious. Now in the opening, there is a bit of an ambient opening, but as soon as like that main synth line comes in, in the, the production and sonically, it's like I'm listening to the same record almost. There's a huge heavy synth sound on this track, and it's also structured with like this rugged sounding bass, and it's also melodic at times, especially in the chorus. Uh, and that kind of just leaves for like certain things like this thin sounding guitar track and multiple guitar tracks even that just kind of get buried, especially on the pre-chorus and chorus. Um, I do love the color when the backing vocals start to become more prominent in the track though, especially when that happens in the second verse. Um, there, the massive synth sounds though, I'd say do become a little overbearing um, and I get some gist in like some same, uh, I guess, nostalgia from listening to like an old Rod Stewart song, uh, maybe like a track like Young Turks. <clears throat> I could be thinking of like another song from the 80s, but uh, it's kind of just like that sort of like synthiness. Um, and uh, I'd say the best part of the track maybe is like the, the Peter Hook like bass line at the end. That happens more than once on this album. And it's also. Um, reminiscent of like the shadow play uh track that they covered from joy division uh so that we kind of do see a little bit of like the derivativeness coming in right on this track overall i don't see i don't think this track is bad uh but it's definitely in your face and telling you what you're going to get on most of this album <clears throat> The next track, Blowback, I thought was an improvement. There's a thumpy synth line, ostinato, that kind of outlines the track. It's almost Sylvan Esso like. Um, there's a bright piano tone uh, that comes in. And uh, it's a very Americana like, especially in the chorus. There's some slide guitar lines that come in and out. Uh, some Fleetwood Mac like backing vocal aesthetics, kind of like Rhiannon. Um, and then some more melodic bass lines, which I think are nice. I think that's, uh, if it's not something that uh, was uh, true, well, the, the bass lines have always been great on Killers tracks, but I like that they're kind of just going with what works, which I think melodic bass lines a lot of the times can't go wrong. Um, there's definitely a sense of going for an endemic and big chorus as well. Um, but the track ends on a very light texture with like this angelic choir. It sounds really pretty. Um, and uh, I even like in the middle of the track when the, the it kind of progresses right before that angelic qu choir comes in and there's like a piano guitar groove thing that's coming in. <clears throat> Overall, I think it just makes for a more interesting um, track and I enjoyed it more than the opening track. Um, I'd say Dying Breed wasn't too... Um, uh, it didn't stick out too much for me. Um, I think there's some issues with the production here. I'd say that was probably my biggest issue. Um, there's some thin guitar lines toward the end that get buried under the synths, and it just sounds a little clashing and not very good. Um, but overall, I thought the track had some decent elements. I like the tight drum groove in the beginning and the syncopated groove as well. Um, the next track I think was great, Caution, which was the lead single. Um, I like the ambient intro and buried vocal tone um, on here. 
um, the right before the main, I guess, gist of the track comes in. But holy reverb on Brandon Flowers' vocals, like that shit is just soaked in reverb. Uh, it's a little distracting at times. Uh, this this track though has the biggest arrival in the chorus by far. When that chorus hits, it it makes itself known, and I I do enjoy it. Um, and I think this track does have similarities to more War on Drugs influence. Uh, the soaring synth lines, the acoustic guitars peeking through. It is just loud. Um, and then the Tom Petty. There's like some Tom Petty influence I think as well, like Americana esque, the gospel backing vocals that come in um the over somewhat this track is somewhat overly derivative i'd say that too uh like i've heard this kind of song before in, in different bits and pieces of other songs i'd say um and um i'd say the the track does have some better uh, highlights too, like some aspects of it that I do like. The pounding drum groove in the chorus adds some nice energy, and the there's an actual guitar solo here used as well, which I feel like if there's something that this album could have used is maybe it's just some more rock elements like a guitar solo or a guitar rift. Um, the next track I felt was maybe a low light. It was called Lightning Field featuring KD Light. I don't know who KD Light is, but I did research. It's a country Canadian artist that, um, I guess, um, you know, is has a really good voice. I, I thought that was something good about this track, that she fit in well. Uh, and the, the the voice sounded good. Um, but I think the song is just some substantially... Um, more interesting and colorful in the beginning, but towards the end it just loses it and it kind of just becomes a little bland. Um, the next track I thought was an improvement, Fire and Bone. Um, I thought it was a pretty good track. I like the lovely bass line that supports the track. There's finally some momentum as well. Um, like I felt like this album was kind of just a little stagnant, but once this track came in with that bass group, it kind of gave it a little bit of energy. I think the vocal performance from Brandon Flowers maybe could have taken a little bit away from like Davy David Bowie or something like that. Um, especially how the the vocals fit into the rest of the music. It's an experimental track. Um, it's pretty colorful as well. It features that another like Peter Hook bass line that you know that comes in. Um, the arrival back to the second chorus is quite good as well. Uh, the track has lots of layers and textures at times. It kind of just kind of evolves as it goes on. I like the melodic embellishments towards the latter end of the track that happens uh, in the verses. Um, it has an overbearing synth tone in the chorus as well in the mix. Um, that I think is a little distracting. I like the overall charisma of the track and the experimental elements. I think it could honestly, it could have passed like for a Gorillaz track featuring Brandon Flowers. And I guess that kind of works more towards my um, suspicion that this music is more towards promoting Brandon Flowers. Um, <clears throat> the next track, Running Towards a Place, I felt like uh, this was... Uh, kind of a middle of the road track. I feel like at some point the production changed a little bit. Uh, the snare wasn't as hot as uh, like the other songs on this tra on this album. Uh, production feels a little bit washed out at times though, and it's just more war on drugs type textures. Uh, My God featuring Waves Blood. I feel like this was probably one of the lowlights on here. It feels like they're kind of just going for like an Arcade Fire type of track, especially with the female vocals of Waves Blood. It kind of just feels like it, it could have been like something on uh, Reflector. Um, it, it like especially with the song the songwriting strategy where this track is just really loud um there's little dynamic contrast it kind of just grows and swells sonically more and more and more and they just reiterate the same chorus hits and it just kind of doesn't do anything it just gets bigger and bigger and then you're at a certain point and you're just like holy shit this track is like really fucking loud um, and I just thought it was just a little derivative of like something Arcade Fire could do, um, but executed uh, more 
uh, or not as well. Uh, and then when the dreams run dry, um, I feel like this is sort of a weak track as well. Um, there's uh, Brandon Flowers does this wailing that really doesn't go over so well. Somewhat of it has a somewhat of a dramatic soundscape with colors coming in and out of the second verse when you get there. The chorus feels a little bit forced and dr over dramatic, and uh, there's a quirky bridge that comes in that I thought was decent. It borrows from, like from Canon and D um, in the chord progression, but I felt like that was probably one of the weakest um, tracks so far. Uh, and by this time, we're from the second to last song. Imploding Mirage is interesting because it sounds like the outlier on this album. Um, it still doesn't have like a lot of grit that I wish it would have had. It's kind of poppy aesthetically. Um, but it does feature a nice vocal performance from Brandon Flowers, uh, primarily in the chorus. Uh, and it, there's less overbearing synth textures, which is a nice contract, uh, contrast in the song. Um, the, there's some chirping vocal things in the opening and verses. Uh, so like, uh, just a lot of bright textures and then, you know, there's a piano, um, too, that's really bright. And, um, I think it's probably one of the most straightforward killer songs. Like this could have been on another killers album, uh, I think, and it would have been quite, uh, quite fitting. And by this point, I think, um, you know, we're at the end of the album, and I certainly don't think this is a bad album, even though I did kind of point out a lot of things that I didn't like. Um, overall, you know, I, I thought they did borrow a lot from The War on Drugs, but I do like that sound, uh, even though it, it might be pretty stagnant after a while and just loud. Um, I thought a lot of the bass lines were good on here. I thought Brandon Flowers, for the most part, did a great job on the singing. The songwriting at, uh, on a lot of these things are is good, too, like Caution, um, Blowback, I thought was a, a good one as well, as well as Fire and Bone. And then some of the tracks, like uh, even the tracks that I thought, you know, could have used improvement, uh, like My God featuring White Blood. I mean, there are some redeeming qualities, and uh, I did kind of think this album was good up until certain things happened, um, you know, like when the dreams went run dry. I don't know how to feel about this. I think I'd give it like a 6 out of 10 uh, if you like The Killers. Uh, definitely check it out. You might think this is a really good album because amongst Killers fans, the, this has is seen as one of the best albums that has been released in a while. Um, I wish, I think I actually am more partial to Wonderful Wonderful, honestly, even though the album, that album was kind of a, a middle of the road type of thing. Um, I don't know. I kind of wish there was a little bit more rock. Uh, in this thing, like more riffs. Uh, sadly, I don't know if we're ever going to get that on a Killers album, but yeah. Um, I, I'd say it's a 6 out of 10. I, I think I liked it just enough more than like my recent 5 out of 10s, like the Taylor Swift album, but I don't like it as much as my 7 out of 10s. It's kind of what I said about Dreamland from Glass Animals, but if you made it to this as part of the review, uh, thanks for listening. Um, I will be rewarding, uh, reviewing more stuff soon, so stick around and take care of yourselves. Bye.